My guest today is Faiza Shaheen, and she's perhaps not as well known as some of the others. So Faiza, perhaps you should tell us, who are you? Wow, who am I? <laughs> it's a philosophical question. Uh, yeah, so I'm someone that grew up in East London, um, sort of worked myself up, but working class background, um, did the really annoying thing by going to Oxford and doing philosophy, politics and economics, realising about incredible privilege and entitlement, and then off the back of that, becoming even more leery than I already was, and working for think tanks, uh, doing a PhD, thinking about the ideas that will change the world and take us in a different direction. Um, and then recently, uh, put myself up to run against Ian Duncan Smith for the Labour Party. So you want to be an MP now? Yeah. Why do you think being an MP is the way to change the world? Because, I mean, lots of people in, interested in politics at the moment have been concluding, you know, it's a terrible thing to try and do. You're either going to be massacred by the media or massacred on social media. You know, we're, we're in this strange period of populist politics um, and, you know, Brexit nightmares. Why do you want to dive into this pool of sharks? In this mad time. I mean, I think it's partly because of that. It's partly, I mean, this hasn't been the plan. Um, but something that struck me in the last couple of years is that there is an opportunity now to put forward ideas that are big and bold, to see them happen. And so, you know, part of me doing this MP thing, which, you know, I still say with a smile on my face because I kind of can't really believe that I'm doing it, it is to, to make the most of this opportunity, this particular point in history where we do have the, you know, the right wing populists and, and ideas that are taking us backwards in many ways, and um, whether that be austerity and the way that the Conservatives are doing Brexit right now, um, is to, to offer a new, a new vision, a new platform. And, and, and on the left as well, isn't it? I mean, isn't Corbyn a left wing populist? You know, different ways in which you define populism. I think often when we're talking about Trump and those type of populist leaders, one thing they do is to talk about I a lot. I'm going to sort this out. I'm going to make this country great again. And I think the thing that's different about Corbyn in that respect is to talk about us together. You know, I, I didn't join the Labour Party. I thought about it in, in my early 20s, but I looked at it and thought, this isn't really a space for me. It's not a space for my politics. Uh, the people that I worked with um, often came from Blair or Brown's office. They were incrementalists. Uh, their view of the world didn't fit with my experience growing up um, or the change that I felt needed to happen. Um, and so I think uh, the difference now about the Corbyn movement is that collective us and that space for people with different thinking to come and join. You think the ideas are bigger? Yeah, I do think the ideas are bigger. And I, I mean, I think they could be bigger still. I'm not saying it's perfect, but look, for someone that always saw austerity as an ideological project. Um, so when Cameron and Osborne used to talk about the big society and then use the financial crisis to talk about the cuts um, and cutting public services, for me, it was always, it was always an ideological project. Um, and understanding what was happening in terms of the economy as well, it, it just struck me how much they were lying to everyone in order to, to promote their ideas. Um, and, and then under Labour, the best we ever got was austerity light. That was something I couldn't sign up to. I couldn't join the Labour Party when it was austerity light. And so even when, when just was that, austerity light? What under mean? Ed Miliband, um, he's a nice guy, but, you know, obviously didn't go far enough in his politics. And I think, um, you know, that difference when Corbyn came out and you looked at the other other politicians running to be leader at the time, and it was like they were saying nothing. They were talking beige. And here was someone that offered something different. And even just that switch from austerity is wrong, which actually should have been the case from the beginning, and isn't that really that radical, but still that suddenly, you know, pricked up a lot of our ears and thought, okay, maybe politics can offer us a way forward. So where do all your ideas come from in terms of your childhood? I mean. Um, your parents are from Fiji and Pakistan. Yeah, my dad was from the Fiji Islands and my mum was from Pakistan. Um, and so, you know, there's a mad history of, uh, you know, my great great grandmother being tricked onto a boat from India to Fiji. And, you know, I, I never remember a time that we weren't aware of empire or, you know, my dad was a car mechanic. He, wa he wasn't massively educated, but he always told us about race. He massively looked up to people like, um, uh, Muhammad Ali. I remember one of, being really little and he, he got us to watch the Parkinson interview with Muhammad Ali and, you know, things like the police would stop him. He was quite a dark, um, big man and the police would stop him all the time. Um, 
and he would always in, in tell Wolfram us Stone. things. Yeah, in Walthamstow, or, you know, just driving around. And he, um, Chinkford and Walthamstow, which is sort of the two areas in which I grew up in because we moved about a bit. And uh, he was just, he would just tell us that race is going to be really important in our lives. I mean, there's this really, this story that just makes me think a lot about my parents who aren't with me anymore. But, um, you know, my my dad used to say, people are going to call you a packy in the playground. And when they do that, you punch them like this. And he used to line us up. He had done boxing himself in Fiji. And he used to line us up and say, punch me here as hard as you can. And he used to make us practice as kids, right? Like six years old. And my mom, who was this incredibly soft uh, woman, would say, no, you just tell them that packy means clean. Um, and, and when it did happen in the playground, and I, this kid, Barry, called me a packy. And I remember thinking... What do I conflicted? And uh, and then I said, Oh, that's not a cast because Paki means clean. And he was so confused. And I remember it striking me then that like actually there's maybe a different way in which to handle these issues that isn't necessarily physical. I was a really skinny child and physical. So the, the, word, the words me. the words won. Yeah, yeah, the words won. Or was it your mother you were listening to rather than your <laughs> probably the best idea listening to my mum. I think I think um I think there was just so many injustices. I had a really mad childhood. My dad was very violent. Um, and so whilst he did teach us about the importance of like our background and that we should own being British because we've been giving to this country for generations. Um, and whilst he, you know, got us to learn about amazing people to look up to in the world, you know, I just remember those everyday injustices of seeing him hit my mother or, um, yeah, like him being stopped by the police. You know, it was just like, it was all around me. It just felt like I was constantly coming up against things that didn't seem fair or that were wrong. So is that where injustice began in, in, in the watching your mother and father? Yeah, I think it was a combination of that. You know, there's not like one moment. It was a combination of that and seeing how also how the outside world would treat, would treat us and, and treat, I think my dad in particular, who, who like I say, was... This what do you mean? Was he? Was he? Was, do, you, do you mean man. people were racist towards him, particularly? Or yeah, so they they were racist towards him. I, they were. I mean, they were racist towards us. Like I said, people in the playground would say things, and I I just think it was there, and and in a way. But what, why do you say that about your dad more than your mum as well? I just think my dad. So my dad um, was just a very outspoken person, and he didn't shy away from it. And the way my mum would sort of hide away and just not ever try and bring herself into contact with that kind of confrontation. But my brother, my dad would do it kind of almost on purpose uh, because he wanted to take it on. He was very um, bold in that way. And he, you know, he would tell us about stories. And my mum would tell us about stories when my mum was pregnant with my older sister that the skinheads approached him in the street and he just like punched them out and he wouldn't take it. So um, were you aware at that age of being blamed by white working class people? For their lives, no, I as, don't. As an immigrant family, look, I don't see or, or do you, it as a white think... working class thing in a way, because, because yes, there was we were faced with racism, um, and and that it was quite a working class neighbourhood. But at the same time, there were also white working class people that were helping my mum, that were helping us, that were our friends. That you know, if people would say things to me in the playground, would say, "Why are you saying that to her?" And so you know, I I I don't like this depiction of the white working class being racist. In my life, I found I got a lot more powerful, sort of explicit racism in a way, and implicit racism when I was at Oxford amongst the elite white who would get drunk and ask me why it is, Pfizer, why is it that black people cause crime? When you look at who's making decisions in society, so the institutional racism that we see, the structural racism, the fact that austerity has hit uh, women of colour, the poorest women of colour the most, that wasn't the white working class making those decisions. That was, you know, Osborne or a white middle class making those decisions. So, you know, I don't think that racism is just a white working class thing. I think it sits across society and it comes out in different ways. Um, and some of that is about blame and some of that is about retaining your own power. And how, how much of that is the reason why you wanted to work in politics and policy? Yeah, I mean, I think part of the reason I wanted to work in policy is because um, that experience of, of, of going to Oxford and being surrounded by uh, arrogance, essentially, um, about the way, the way the world should look and that this is my entitlement. You know, that kind of Boris attitude that was definitely there and I recognise, I see in him and I see it with people that I went to uni with. 
um, I just thought, you know what, I've got to be on my game because these guys are going to rule the world and I'm not going to like what they're doing. And it's not going to be enough for me just to sit at home and shout at the telly. I've been given this incredible privilege, given my background, to be here, to know how they think, to have seen them drunk and know what they really think of us, um, to then take that forward and think about how we then not only have policy change, but also make sure that different voices are represented. So you know, the amount of times I'm on panels and we'll be talking about changing the welfare system where I'm the only one that's lived on benefits as a child or uh, lived in housing that was condemned or, you know, and it's, um, we need more of those voices, but unless I'm gonna also push myself forward, then I can't encourage other people to do it. So how, how has your thinking changed? Because obviously you, you went to university, you did a PhD, and then you started working in think tanks, which is quite a traditional route for yeah. bright young things, from, especially from Oxbridge, you want to then work in, in politics. Um, what, what was your aim at that stage? I just came out of uni and just felt, of my undergrad, and just felt like really uncomfortable with what I'd learned. I felt like it didn't fit with the experience I'd had in life or many of my friends were having. Um, I felt like I didn't know anything. So that was partly why when I got offered the scholarship to do a master's and PhD, I took it because I was like, okay, maybe I can actually make sense of something um, and be useful to the world because I have knowledge. I can't just go out and yes, I was passionate and leery and, but you know, I've got to know what I'm talking about. I understand that some people in the world and in politics don't feel that need of needing to know what they're talking about, but I certainly didn't have the confidence just to go out and you know, make assertions without knowing it in depth. Um, so, you know, that's why I did that master's and PhD. But it comes back to that thing about it was, it's a very elite space. And unless I also had those elite qualifications, it would have probably been hard for me to, to get in and, and come in at a level where I could start having a voice. But the, the thing about think tanks um, and academia is that you can think the unthinkable and you can, you can explore ideas and you can uh, look at things that political parties aren't. Yeah. You've now decided to be a Labour politician. Yeah. That's going to constrain you in all sorts of ways. Yeah, no, well, I mean, I doing love it? doing the big thinking and I, you know, and I was like a geeky stats person as well. I loved looking at the spreadsheets and doing the analysis. Um, and, you know, it's funny you keep saying that you're a Labour politician now. My brother said this to me the other day, you're a politician now, and it's such a dirty word, isn't it? My immediate reaction is like, oh, no. Um, but it comes back to that point of the change that I wanted to see or I want to see isn't just academic. It's for real. You know, this isn't just about um, some book that I've been reading or, you know, just in order to have more knowledge and to seem smarter in the world. It's the change I want to see. So if, which seems very out of the blue, you know, we've been given this opportunity to lay out a different way forward and to push people to accept those bold ideas and see them happen. Then why wouldn't I do that? I mean, saying that, I am, con I am obviously concerned about the way in ways in which being a Labour politician will mean that I can't say certain things. Um, I mean, I'm more concerned that I'm going to turn into a horrible person that doesn't care about uh, the world anymore, just cares about my ego. You know, I've worked in the think tank world for 10, 15, well, 15 years now, and I, I've met too many pol politicians like that, even Labour politicians. Um, so, yeah, I am concerned about those things. I'm concerned how I'm going to stay grounded and still retain my values. That's why I'm trying to surround myself still with my family and my husband, who's, you know, also from a working class background and um, not, not think I'm bigger than I am. I'm one person. Um, so what are the big things you want to do? I think there's some big arguments that need to be made right now. Um, I think the big thing is that we haven't done the vision. I mean, part of the reason we're in the mess that we are, say, even with Brexit, is because there's no vision for what we want the country to be. Um, and so the hard Brexiteers might have some kind of vision of a low tax, low, low regulation country, but what is our other vision? And I think that's what's been emerging in the last couple of years um, since, since Corbyn, since our manifesto last year, is this sense of things like bringing back things into public ownership about the collective um, about the sort of what we might call socialist values that will become even more important in a world where we're faced with climate change, demographic change, and um, technological change. Well, and what is the vision? Just lay it out in simple terms. Yeah, if I you mean, think it exists. No, I mean I think it's it's coming. I think you know I think maybe the best way for me to describe it is 
um, my mum passed away last year and um, before that she had a very successful heart transplant. Well, it was successful at the time. Um, but we were sitting in a intensive care waiting room. Um, and obviously we've, with, with my mum, we used the NHS a lot over the last 10 years. And, you know, I've seen it decline in all kinds of ways. But the, we were sitting in this intensive care room and there were, and it was out in Cambridgeshire, amazing hospital, Patworth Hospital, uh, NHS hospital. But there were, so there were different families in that room, all very stressed. We all felt that we were going to lose our family members. There was um, a young woman about my age whose husband was there. She was from Cambridge. Her, her brother-in-law was a banker. There was Brexit voters there. It was, you know, it was a real mix of people in terms of socioeconomic background and race um, and political opinion. And yet we, in those days, we looked after each other. We, um, we had empathy for each other um, and we cared for each other. And those things became less important. Things maybe we touched upon here and there, but you know, human values came to the fore. In the last 30 years, and certainly it's felt very strong in the last eight years, is that we've had values of not trusting people, of mistrust. So, you know, part of the way the welfare system is built now is you have to prove, even as a vulnerable person, even as a person with a disability, you have to prove that you deserve that entitlement first. Everyone's going to think you're a liar before they think that you, you might just be going through a hard time. So I think there's a values change. In that situation, you know, I thought a lot about it afterwards, that the NHS and public institutions that bring us together and allow us to rebuild some of the bonds that have been broken over the last 30 years of a very individualistic mentality. So when I talk about a vision for the future, I talk about um, you know, a place where we are coming together, where we do care for each a, other. A and that sounds, of society. Yeah, and it sounds really cheesy, but in a way, because, you know, even our conception of social mobility. So people will often look at me and go, oh, you're a great story of, you know, you can come from anywhere and get to the top, whatever that means. You know, I was told that you've got to escape. Meanwhile, my family was in trouble and my neighbourhood has declined. Um, so what, is that success that I got out and I sound a bit posher now and I pronounce some of my T's, if not still all of them? Um, you know, we've had this conception for so long. So part of this is a narrative of, goes back to that narrative of us, and building institutions that allow us to come together. But the, I mean, the example you've given is, is obviously a very intense, you know, uh, um, an emotional um, situation, uh, you know, in, in an NHS hospital. Isn't it quite hard to sort of build those kinds of links between people in normal day-to-day -day life. Because the, the reason Britain is like this after eight years is because of economic stress. Mm. You know, the, the reason people are tested for benefits is because there's no money. The reason there is, you know, jealousy of people and communities, you know, at each other's throats is because, you know, people are under a lot of economic pressure. Yeah, I Isn't mean, that I... the basic issue that you've got to solve first? What we've heard way too much in, in the previous decades. It's like, this is just how it is. I mean, it's like, well, this is, this is just because we don't have money. We do have money and we can make decisions about how we spend that money. Um, and, you know, well, society can't get any better than this. Really? It can't get any better than this? It can't get any better than, you know, the million plus packages that, I help, that are given out in food, at food banks now? I mean, I think a lot of people are looking around them and seeing homelessness grow looking at their own pockets, we're back to record levels of household debt and thinking, I'm working really hard. I'm doing all of the things that you told me to do. Um, I'm not happy, I'm stressed, my life is difficult. I'm seeing around me um, things that I don't wanna see that also you know, get to me that make me feel uncomfortable about the world in which I live in. Um, and so I, I absolutely reject that it has to be this way. Um, but saying that, we have to be very clear about what the other way looks like. and. Um, you know, I think debt and money and the money that we have as a country is, that, is probably core to that new story we tell. So at, for the last 10 years, we've heard we spent too much. And, you know, the first thing that anyone ever says to me when I'm doing interviews, when I say we should do X and Y is, is to say, well, where's the money going to come from? We don't have the money. You know, we had money, of course, to give to DUP. Um, and, and we have money to bomb Syria when we want to overnight. Um, that's not how the money system works. And actually, what they've done by making us focus always on the debt of this country is to say um, the politics of austerity, which is essentially, um, this is 
this is all, this is as good as it gets, that we're not worth investing in. So, under, and the undercurrent but don't you also that, have to come up with pools of money that aren't just defence? I mean, that, that is always the sort of the argument of the left, isn't it? You know, no, well, and we've, I look... We've got money for Trident, we've got money to no, bomb the, Syria. No, the point... Once you've used up the 2% of GDP that we spend on defence, you've got, to, you've got to find another pool of money somewhere. No, so that's... I mean, my argument is yes, so absolutely. My point about that is that we always find money when we need it, right, in those situations. Look, I think that we need to think more about borrowing. Borrowing is not a bad thing, right? Borrowing to invest, and companies understand this well. You know, when you hit a hit a block and you're like, we need to like take us to a next level. We need to get some money in to help us do that because otherwise we're going to be stuck here. And at a time when we need to up our infrastructure because we are facing all kinds of crises, there is a cost of doing nothing. So when I talk about this politics of austerity, it's a politics of a, a lack of ambition. What we do you think we move... should have done then? When Cameron and Osborne, as you see it, had this ideological vision to cut the state um, and, and, and call it austerity, what should they have done instead? Well, we because should have done, we should have done what we did. Because you said Miliband was lacking but Miliband's vision was to borrow more and to spend more, wasn't it? Yeah, but it's the scale of that and it's also the narrative. So he still spoke about austerity like we should have rejected outright. I mean, A, it wasn't like Labour's mess. It was a global financial crisis. Um, and absolutely, we should have learned our lessons about the lack of regulation and, and what got us to that point. Um, and so, you know, at that point, I would have said we do what we did um, in previous years, was it the Great Depression, whether it's after the war, and we borrow, we take some strategic ideas about where that in infrastructure will pay back, and well, it will increase tax take. Um, we make sure that people like our nurses have money in their pockets because they go out and spend, and that keeps the economy going. Um, and so look, at this time of crisis, of national and international crisis, we need to get out of that, not just by digging the hole deeper, which is essentially what we did, but we need to find ways in which we get the materials to keep going. Um, the trouble is we never know, do we? We, we? we will never know which was the right idea. I mean, we kind of do know, actually, because you can look at different country experiences at that point, and you can say, right, when we took out money, we took out money and the private sector also wasn't investing because they're coming out of this crisis. Suddenly the economy slows. We've had the slowest recovery of any OECD country post-recession. So we do know that austerity was wrong. It was economically defunct. But what but was... we, we don't know that the, that the alternative would have worked, is my point. So, you know, whenever well, Labour and Conservatives Obama took argue a different about route. what we should have done... Yeah, but I mean, it's, a, it's, it's just not the same, is it? It's not, it's, it's not, it's not a simple comparison when it comes to, to Britain and America. And, I mean, and so when we come to this sort of... Um, the, 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 the attack on austerity as the wrong thing and, 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 and the, the suggestion that we should have had a big infrastructure, you know, Keynesian, invest, Keynesian investment, mm -hmm. and that would have got us out of the trouble. Um, how well, not do we, just out of that trouble. How, how do we ever decide as a country... Um, to take the risky route? Because what, what you're suggesting terrifies people. And it terrifies people because we've been told that having borrowing to invest as a country is risky, is somehow something that um, your children and grandchildren will have to pay back in, in later years. But actually, well, that is true, what, our, <laughs> what our young people will pay back in, uh, and, and grandchildren and children will pay back in, in future years is not having a country fit for purpose. You know, we always forget, and this is the problem when we, you know, focus in on austerity, that this isn't just about austerity. This is about where we are in history, where we are facing huge challenges. Right, right now on climate change, yes, we're enjoying the warm weather, but when you look across what's happening in the world, um, from the fires to people dying from heat, we know that climate change is, is, is taking place, and yet we are not doing enough to green our infrastructure. Um, so, you know, in 20 years' time, when other countries are sorted and we're behind and companies actually are paying loads of money to, to try and fix things in the aftermath, they're not going to be too pleased about us not taking the action right now and not taking the action when we could at cheap borrowing rates taking the action, and, the, and, these, and this is what we forget, that those investments more than pay for themselves over the years, right? As a country, we're not just thinking about next year. We're thinking about the future, our collective future as society. Um, and so it's, it's frustrating that we've let the argument run so far on, on debt and the politics of austerity. And, you know, now we need a new politics of ambition. I mean, one of the... Th well, ambition is, is, is a really interesting word, isn't it? Because what I was going to say is, what, you know, one of the things that traditionally frustrates conservative voters um, about the, the kind of politics you're 
proposing is what it means for the individual, what it means for ambition, what it means for entrepreneurship. H how do you sell the idea that you can be an individual success and you can be an entrepreneur and you can make, um, you know, you can do well yourself alongside this vision of collective responsibility and collective spending? Yeah, I mean, I think there's something about, I, think, I, I take that point. I think people do, do come back with that. And it um, puts a lot of people off, doesn't it? Because they feel that their own ambitions and their own desire, you know, ability to better their own lives and their children's lives will be stifled by what you're suggesting. Yeah, but how do you, so ambition on its, by itself is not enough. So my mum called me Faiza Shaheen, that's, Shaheen was originally my middle name, and she called me Faiza Shaheen because Faiza meant a winner and Shaheen meant a bird that flies high. She had incredible ambitions for me. Now, if um, life had been different and I'd been in Pakistan and her family there are low, in low-income neighborhoods, I wouldn't have had the education, I wouldn't have had the opportunities. So there's, and that came from the public state, right? So, you know, when you talk about ambition, you need the infrastructure to make sure that that, that plays out, you know, and I always say, I went to the same school as David Beckham and Harry Kane. I don't know why our school churned out these amazing footballers, um, but it did. And, and, you know, and I always think, look, right now, because the football is good at picking up people from working class backgrounds, um, but other sectors aren't. And we're missing out on the Ian Wrights and the David Beckhams and the Harry Kanes and politics and media. And we, we are not seeing that talent come forth because uh, we have such huge inequalities. And if you want to care about ambition, if you want the dream to be real, then we need to make sure that those rungs and the ladders aren't as far apart as they are right but now. But the fear is always you're going to level down rather than level up, isn't it? That's the argument, you know. Well, if look, I mean, I think for the most part, I think most of the population... Uh, is worried, you know, even the middle class are seeing their kids not being able to move out. Um, in lots of ways, uh, young people are obviously coming out of university with huge amounts of debt. They're not getting the same good graduate jobs. They're getting stuck in jobs that are low paid. And the majority of the population is starting to question this model as working for an amb ambitious society. And yes, there are some people, the top 5% say, that have... Um, had uh, privilege through money or race or class, um, and they've they've managed to retain a certain amount, a, a certain living for them and their children through networks, etc. Um, I we don't have to win everyone over, um, and so yes, it's right that we need to share out a bit more, um, and so. If some people, if the top 5% are saying that actually we don't agree with this, then that's not a problem. If it's the top 50%, that's the, that's trouble. the problem, It's, it's not right? just the, the top 5%, is it? Because traditionally, the, what Labour ends up butting up against is, um, you know, the aspirational middle class who want to do better than where they are right now, and they fear um, that a Labour government that wants to tax them more and redistribute more yeah, but I mean, will hit them but I mean, rather a lot than of the, the super rich. A lot of the middle class now are voting Labour and they're voting Labour exactly because we are at this uh, end point of a kind of market fundamentalism that now is not playing out for them or their kids because they can't, their kids can't afford housing and they can't get secure work. So, so more and more people have actually, got nothing to Actually, in a lose way, now. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when I think of young people and I meet so many young people from, you know, much wealthier backgrounds than myself, but they are saying, you know, they are voting Labour and they're really enthusiastic about Corbyn. And it's because, look, when you've got no capital, they've got no capital, they're not going to be capitalists and they are going to look at other places for, for a different but idea. Isn't that a very dangerous place to be? Because some people will look to you and will look to Corbyn and say, yeah, look, we've got nothing to lose, let's go for that. That's a radical alternative vision that redistributes wealth across society and maybe I'll get a chance. And other people will look to right-wing ideologues and populists and say, no, you know what? What we need to do is do something radical like end immigration or, you know, or, or send people home or all of those sorts of things. And so to rely on people having nothing to lose as an electoral strategy is really risky, isn't it? Mm. No, I, don't, I mean, I think... Um, Which is what Labour seems to be doing right now. I don't think, I mean, I don't think that's good enough. And I don't think like, no, nothing to lose is not, is not why you want people. You want people to vote for you positively. They, you want them to believe in your vision. Um, but look, I, I've reflected on this quite a lot when the Brexit vote happened and how ugly it got in terms of the anti-immigration sentiment and the racism and the Islamophobia. And I just thought, you know, I've spent 10 years or so um, raising awareness of inequality, of economic inequality, which when I first started my career, people used to tell me that no one cared. And, you know, Pfizer, just think about GDP. But in a way, we didn't 
give people somewhere positive or constructive to put that anger. Um, and I think that's why when it came to a vote uh, where people could easily be misled as to, to think it's this is the fault of immigration or, you know, see it as an anti-elite um, vote, but not also recognise that the people that were funding the, the Brexit vote were also part of an elite and have their own agenda. Um, you know, it's that's what happens when you don't have... A, a clear alternative. And so, I, you know, I absolutely agree. And that's partly why I'm entering politics, because we're facing this real moment of truth, whereby we either offer a, a left platform that says, look, we're going to make your lives easier. We're going to do something about housing. We're going to do something about schools. Um, you know, we're going to do something to make sure that your kids aren't coming out with huge amounts of debt, uh, making sure that there are good non-graduate jobs and making sure that that's spread across the country. Um, or... You have a politics that is very much where we are on Brexit, on, on of hate, of blame, um, of one of saying, you know, forgetting this country's history and saying that we essentially, you know, th this is the only reason we're not going to get our own way is treachery, leading to leading to more divisiveness and more fractures in this country. Um, and and it's a it's a worrying time, of course, of course, it's a worrying time. And and the only way you can fight that though is not to go quiet. Is to make your case even louder. And do you agree with Labour's position on Brexit? I think, you know, I totally understand why they fudged it last year. I think this has been a moving beast. I'm not one, I'm not, I voted Remain, but I'm not a person that thinks the EU is perfect. I think in many ways, some of the criticisms of it being a, an elite project and the way it's treated Greece, for instance, is, is fair. Um, but ultimately it's not worth all of this trouble to get out of it because we have wasted two years going around in circles. So would you like to try and reverse it? The problem with running another referendum, right, given how divisive it was the first time, is that if it's a very similar result or one or two percentage each way, it's only going to cause more divisiveness in this country. So I get the point about doing a referendum when it makes most sense. I mean, personally, I'd prefer that we had a general election um, and... I think I think that because not only can we then take nuanced positions on Brexit, um, but also we can remember there's a whole bunch of other stuff that needs to be sorted. So, isn't, you know, isn't this a very da dangerous Labour position, though, in that Labour, Labour seems to be in this position where it's saying we are not going to support the softer Brexit that Theresa May has put forward, and, and therefore we will end up voting with the hard Brexiteers on the ERG in the Conservative Party to defeat this effectively if it's put to us. Um, and so we will push Britain towards a hard Brexit because we think we will then win a general election I mean, I think and sort it all out. I mean, that yeah. seems very... No, I mean, I really take issue with the idea that Labour's somehow voting against a soft Brexit with what Theresa May's offer offered. It's a nonsensical Brexit. It's one that's not going to work. It's, it's, be one... it's better than a hard Brexit, though, isn't it? I mean, she's got not... What's the Northern Ireland island situation? You know, it's, it's, you know, a hard Brexit. I mean... It's such a fudge. It may and be. It's not very unclear what you're voting what I mean for there is, when, you're, when you're on the side of Theresa May. I mean, who knows? But imagine Europe were to accept this offer. You would rather that than a hard Brexit, wouldn't you? Well, I mean, it depends what that offer is, right? And that's the point. We, no one understands. Like, Danny Dyer said it so well, and he's, he deserves a, an award. But, you know, it's, it's a riddle. And, I, you know, I, this is my job, and I've been keeping on top of it. And but you're you taking my basic the point still... that Labour's, Labour's pushing us towards a hard Brexit as well because it thinks we'll get a general election and then Labour will be in power. Look, look Labour's doing its job as the opposition to say... You don't have a plan that's going to work. It's not going to deliver on job. It's not going to deliver on the Northern Ireland island border. Um, it's their job to push back against this absolute chaos that Tories have got us into. So, I, you know, what are they meant to do, really, apart from what they're doing, which is, you know, what they're, what they're elected to do. there's a consequence to, to that, isn't there, which is look, that we I mean, could I be think, closer to the cliff edge. Look, if this conversation was Theresa May saying we're going to stay in the single market and we're going to... Then I would say, look, you know, Labour needs to think about that because, actually, we don't want to go into a disaster situation. But that's not what's on offer here. So it's a hypothet hypothetical but conversation. But you think things might change quite dramatically then? So you, you think if public opinion gets closer to the cliff edge, it will change. And then Labour I mean, might change. It's, it's is, that, is that such, what you hope? It's such a mess right now. If you get to a situation whereby no deal is very likely, and one of the things that you have said is that the only way they'll extend that is if there's a change in our in our electoral politics or if we have a, a people's vote or if we have a, another general election, then I think those things become an inevitability. Because they, I mean, it's, it's it strikes me and uh, that this is 
as big a mess as we could be in, in terms of Brexit, in terms of the time wasted, in terms of the the attitude that we've had, um, the very poor negotiating, negotiating skills. Um, I think it feels as if we are going down that road. Um, and that's, there's no good solution here. I think that's, that's so, my so point. So if we end up in a general election scenario, what should, what would you be standing on? What would you say this is what we should do? On Brexit? Yeah. Look, again, look, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat. If, if Forget that you're standing for Labour for a second. <laughs> what do yeah. you think? Look, I think Brexit is not, is not worth it at all. Um, and I think that um, we were misled at the time and we hadn't thought it through. Um, and I think we, there's nothing wrong sometimes with admitting that we didn't have all of the information. And now that we have the information and it's very clear that, you know, the world that the Ian Duncan Smith sold to us or Boris, that they haven't even been able to come up with a clear plan of what that looks like, um, is to say, look, we know that there are deep problems in this country. We know that the areas that most vote, that voted Brexit most um, have issues of being left behind or even held back, you could say. Um, and this is our plan for what we're going to do to address the, the huge geographical inequalities in this country. This is, you know, this is the plan that's going to deal with the issues that you've raised. Um, alongside, and this is the thing, you know, I'm not one of these people that think that the Brexit vote was purely economic. I think it, there was an element of prejudice involved and it was about anti-immigration. And so we need to do that bit as, as well. As so what left. do you do about immigration? Do you deliver to those communities the stop on freedom of movement that they are demanding? No, I think we have a conversation that is, look, even you, you can see right now, wrong. even what we, what we have right now, I mean, this has been so many years in the making, so it's really hard to do in a, like a two-month general election, right? But look, I'm not someone that will say that I think immigration is bad for this country. I'm never going to say that, and I'm not going to lie about that. Um, someone's going to play this back to me in years to come, aren't they? I mean, we have a history of immigration and, and immigration in this country that goes back um, centuries, and we've been very dishonest about that past and we're being very dishonest about our future where we will need people in this country because uh not only reflecting our past but also because of demographic change like who's going to pay your pension so do you think labor's been wrong then to come to this position where it says we will deliver the end of freedom of movement because that's what i think it, i think for? they haven't been strong enough on making the counter argument to the anti-immigration and and certainly even with um, Windrush, which, you know, amazing, people like Diane Abbott and Corbyn and John McDonnell had initially voted against the immigration bill and they, they were right to do that. But, you know, our response wasn't right, we're gonna end deportation targets. We're gonna, you know, and I'm glad that Diane Abbott came out and said that we're gonna close Yarl's Wood and the rest of it, but we need a broader narrative about what we do on immigration. And we've been quiet on that. We have been quiet on that. Um, and so you want more, don't you? I want much leadership. more. Yeah. I want much more. I'm supportive, but I want more. Yeah. And I want to push us to do more. I think, I think, you know, I speak to so many people younger than me and, and it's not, I just feel like it's not good enough. And even we've, we're offering more than we've done in my lifetime, but it's still not good enough. Like given the challenges we face, given the mess we're in, given the lies that have been told, you know, we need to just go bigger and bolder. I heard someone say it recently about John F. Kennedy used to talk about putting a man on the moon and now we don't have something that's the equivalent. We just don't go really big and amb ambitious anymore. Um, and I think it's time that that ends. Do you honestly think that Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell, Diane Abbott are the generation who can deliver that? I mean, I think... when I talk to you, you're sounding much more sort of radical and big idea-ish than they are. Maybe they're sort of, you know, tainted by years and years yeah. of real politics and being at the front line. Yeah, I don't think there's anything that, that I've said that they would necessarily disagree with. You know, it's a bit like the Barney, Bernie Sanders thing. It's like a really funny thing. You see like John McDonnell and then, or, or Jeremy Corbyn even, who's older, right? Jeremy Corbyn and then there's this whole bunch of young people really excited about meeting him around him. And it seems a bit ludicrous. Like it's the same with like Sanders. She gets it. It's like how, how cool these people have become. But it's like they're from an era where socialism wasn't a, a bad thing, a bad idea or a dirty word. And so, you because know, they haven't back, lived but they're bringing... I mean... Well, I mean, look, so, socialism means so many different things to different people. For me, it's about, you know, a life lived with dignity, about not being scared about state taking action where it needs to take action. It's about a mixed economy. It's, you know, the market and the state 
working together. But the bogeymans of the 70s mean nothing to that generation, is the point. So yeah. That, that's why they're able to embrace it. Yeah, they're able to embrace it. And it makes sense to them. And these are the people saying it. We haven't had, we didn't have an alternative to Corbyn, right? So if, if Labour doesn't win the next general election, I mean, do you think these ideas will die? You know, will Labour have to rethink and go back to some sort of softer ground? Or do you think people like you will win out? I think, we're, we're, I think we are winning. I mean, I think that's what we've seen in the last couple of years, that people are well, you're winning up. within the Labour Party, people you're not winning are, in the country. No, we are winning in the country. Look, right, last year in the general election, yes, we didn't win the general election. Yeah. But given, you know, that was the first time we could come out and talk about ideas. Um, if you think about it, before then, it was all Labour infighting. That was the story. Um, you know, we got the manifesto, we could come out. And I, as a think tank director, was going out talking about the ideas and people were so interested in them. I had friends that never talked to me about politics. I thought I had no idea what I did, but during the general election were able to say to me, Pfizer, the Labour manifesto is really good. It's got this and it's got this. And it's, they could talk back to me about, you know, what they're doing on housing and what they're doing on student fees. And, and all they remembered of the Conservatives was fox hunting and the dementia tax, right? And so I think ideas are winning ground. And this is where me as a kind of, you know, ultimately a policy geek, is, it's so exciting because I think the ideas can both unite us and inspire us. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's not that much of a transition coming from a sort of think tanky background um, going into the world of politics of what it should be today, because it should be about ideas. Apart from reversing Brexit, what, what, what's the craziest, hardest to deliver idea that you would like to embrace? Hardest to deliver. I mean, one idea I've been thinking a lot about is, um, I don't know that it's hard to deliver, but, um, or maybe it is, is a 100% is a uh, renewable energy project that also is then practically free for people to use. So um, a really ambitious idea of saying by 2025, like really just like really going for it, setting a target that's like by 2025, we're gonna have 100% renewable energy and that is gonna be, you know, very, very cheap for people. Um, and almost sort of free energy. I mean, there's something I was, I, I get invited to these meetings, which is strange because I'm the only lefty in the room and it's sort of business execs from around the world. Um, and one of the things they were saying is like, imagine the first country that comes up with very cheap or free renewable energy. Every business is going to want to go there. There's all kinds of positive impacts of that kind of, um, that kind of policy. And um, you would just get, you would fund it out of taxation? No, I think it's a matter of... Uh, taxation, borrowing for infrastructure. Um, you have to look at the ways in which different uh, different countries are doing it because, is you know, it, some countries like Denmark return, have already got... very low return, you'd struggle to, to repay it, wouldn't you? So... I think, actually, the returns are much higher than... We, when you look at the business case, weirdly, I was talking to someone from BP about this, and she was saying, actually, when you look at renewables, when you look at some of the um, offshore winds, for instance, the returns on them are once you take into account oil spills and all the rest of it are just just as much, if not higher. And then you remember like the, the population, the planet, you know, the returns to us, it's worth making that investment. So I think we should have some really bold, visionary ideas like that, that, that just, that would fundamentally change this country and also live our values, live our values of collective ownership, of not putting profit before people in the planet. So I think those sorts of ideas appeal to me. And they, they wouldn't be easy to get through, I mean, but I think whenever I say them to people, they're always like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, like I say, who owns the sun or the water anyway, that should be our collective resource. Faisal Shaheen, thank you very much indeed.